Tales of the Vast, Chapter One, Advent. The verdant free country of Maelon knows what the sages and scribes of tomorrow will describe as a golden age. As a forest reborn of destructive fire, the vast, so named by the elders, revels in prosperity and quietude only the most ancient of almanacs can recall. For those blessed to be alive during this era of plenitude, the very idea of peace is an abstract one, as all they have come to know is laughter, love, abundance, and peaceful slumbers. Ninety-nine terms have passed since the end of the war, marking this new beginning. Ninety-nine winters, an eternity for man, but not so for our country. To preserve the memory of less fortunate times, the Order of the Guardians keeps track of events, both recent and old, on stone and paper, alongside other forgotten secrets. The free folk of Maelon are thriving, yet the Guardians have gathered in secrecy, an irrefutable sign of grim tidings. Offerings are made to those who are benevolent, and their verdict is unequivocal. The darkness has awoken. The soothsayers are chanting the misfortunes endured by their ancestors and prophecies of a great war to come. Consulting the Grand Augurs, the Order of the Guardians confirms this dark omen. Evil has returned, stronger than ever, and the chaos raging throughout Maelon is only one of its first taunts. With an iron hand, Baragons and Paladins of the Order try to grasp the cause of this sudden disorder, questioning one by one those you so discord. Silent as to the motives behind their actions, the culprits still reveal a pernicious clue. They all seem compelled to inscribe glyphs of vile appearance as they commit their misdeeds. Engraved in wood, carved in stone, traced in sand, and even cut in the flesh of their makers, these sinister inscriptions spread like a horrible disease throughout the land. For many moons, those who will come to be known as the wretched disturb the once peaceful Maelon, marking their crimes with diabolical symbols that none can fathom. The Guardian's high auspices meet in conclave to act against the awakening of evil. After much debate, the decision is made. The young and spirited Captain Nizalion will be the emblem of the united peoples of Maelon in the face of the unknown. But how does one fight such an inert force seemingly pulled by the strings of entropy? By themselves, the wretched are but a mere nuisance. But their apparent lack of free will and fierce hatred of each other are making near to impossible the task of unveiling the true cause of this upheaval. What could it be? It is agreed that the only escape from this impasse is to seek the help of the legendary Enchantress Azadia, whom no souls happened upon for decades. A 
His armor inlaid with the noblest treasures is early on right and vulnerable into the wilderness, blessed by all the saints in the land. In search of the elusive sorceress, his travels take him across haunted seas, sacred mountains, majestic forests, and lush green plains. In turn, he meets tritons, elves, dwarfs, and giants, until he is singularly welcomed by sporty gnomes of ineffable curiosity and age-old memory. They share with him the knowledge of a druidess who, in fear of unveiling dark secrets, has gone into exile in the far deserts. The great storm is rising. Trembling mountains and earthquakes reveal the bowels of the earth, disfiguring the land and making forests fade into bleakness. A cloud emanating from the depths spread vapors into the air, carrying a nefarious spell. There is not a single man, woman, or beast that does not stare at the sky as the coldness masks the rays of the sun, seizing each new day thrusting before the promise of a devastating fatality. The great city-states of the vast are in unprecedented turmoil. In their midst ferments an unspeakable hatred bordering on madness, as even mighty lords lock themselves in their castles, abandoning their people to the night. As the rich continue to wreak havoc in all civilized counties, their black writing adds to every misdeed, a terrifying aura that debases the hopes of an entire people. Eastern air reaches Vic's open window. By the glow of a flickering candle, the old wizard scribbles an umpteenth page. Annoyed by the fluttering papers on his table, he pauses, grumbles, and starts writing anew. Had Vic had an apprentice, as is customary for all wise men of the region, he would have instantly noticed that his master's usually supple calligraphy had become brusque and taut, each written character so vile and repulsive in shape as to be too painful to contemplate. It must be said that Old Vic is far from endearing. Having lost wife, children, and friends in an ancient war, he who was once a brilliant enchanter in the service of the Guardians, is now a wounded spirit, forever bitter and disillusioned. He lives in seclusion, brooding over a century-old anger that none can bear. Beyond his control, his trembling hand scrapes the paper with force, tracing violent shapes that resonate in his head like the first sounds of a new language. Days he rides, neglecting to eat and sleep, staring at his blackened pages. A flash of lightning brightens his room when abruptly he stops, dropping his quills, though suddenly understanding some great truth. His eyes light up in an almost divine swoon. Barely dressed, he rushes out of his home into the raging storm to seek out the one calling him. Chapter 2 Awakening For days, Isalion meanders through the arid expanse of red sands, with the remains of his long dead horse as his only provisions. He scans the horizon one last time for any sign of the Enchantress, before collapsing exhausted into a cloud of dust, drawing in the desert scavengers. 
the atrocious reminiscence of poison fangs and stingers piercing his flesh fades into the sight of an incredibly beautiful woman. Like two sapphires in a silken jewel box, light blue eyes against coppery skin cast a gaze that is incisive and deep, yet dreamy and absent, as though part of her dwells in an elsewhere none could imagine. Seeing in the young paladin the strength and conviction she had long since dreamt of, Azaria, enchantress of the most ancient of Maelonic myths, reveals the essence of what she has divined. In the Temple of Aya, a forgotten tomb offers all the answers in the world. Source of suffering and destruction, this creation must remain hidden, but they must act swiftly, for it is awakened, and the wretched already are seeking it. Vic is getting closer, he senses it. Driven by a liveliness unheard of for a man of such an age, he hunts down his rivals tirelessly, executing them one by one with ferocity and contempt until they are no more. Having become a grotesque shadow of his former self, his own tattered body now gouged with abject text, he progresses undaunted, guided by the promise of a terrifying reward. Vic, last of the wretched, has understood that the symbols of death which taint Maelan are but a part of the mystery brought forth by some obscure speaker. Calculations, riddles, puzzles, and notions of absurd complexity were executed in vain by the wretched, as though their minds endowed with supernatural abilities were commandeered for some dark purpose. Purpose Vic would soon discover. Once surmounted by colonnades whose magnificence was equaled only by the sumptuous gardens that adorned them, the Temple of Aya is now all but forgotten. Beneath the ruins of the ancient glory lies an inverted pyramid of titanic proportions. Place of endless suffering, invisible, except to all those who heed its call. In its first level lies Agnosaurus, great fresco of the early ages. One of the bygone immortal tormentors, this entity of pure malice winds on the walls in eternal expectation of worthy visitors. With her, Vic converses at length, engaging in a verbal battle marked by the most devious pitfalls. For days on end, the old wizard brandishes all known languages in a duel of the mind where the slightest mistake would prove to be fatal. Not once does he give in to the vicious stratagems of the great fresco. Not once does he fail to argue the relevance of his presence demonstrating his achievements and proving his grasp of the black words with conviction and eloquence. Defeated, Agnosaurus opens the passage to the lower levels. She reveals to Vic what destiny holds should he succeed the next trials. A great black worm he would become. Formidable and eternal, stronger than a midday sun, and more treacherous than a midnight moon. In this new form, he would escape the torments of life forever. Gifted with knowledge, more potent than any mortal has ever wielded. Obsessed by this new possibility of immortality and magnificence, Vic undertakes the long descent towards the One who relentlessly calls to him. The fiber 
Fortress of Time realign as its titanic ego emerges from an Eonian dormancy. Chanting incantations and spells of irresistible veneration, the Codex, an entity of axiomatic somber conoisance, foments a new punishment for the mortal world to endure. As he approaches the temple buried by the sands of time, Azelion falls before its omniscient gaze, recognizing in the young paladin the incarnation of the nemesis. The Codex seizes his soul, and his body vanishes as though it had never existed. In a blink, Azelion materializes into the heart of the temple. Vic is already inside, past the wrangling serpent. Animated by the promise of a grandiose reign, he descends, wielding pagan magics, teeming with fury, making fire blaze and lightning crack, obliterating hordes of mummified warriors resurrected to defy him. Facing an evil so terrifying as to make any other man die of fear, Vic conjures the elements into a cyclone of destruction and single-handedly overwhelms the last kings of an ancient empire. Dazed and disoriented, Azalion advances in the depths of labyrinthine corridors infested with the most terrible of monstrosities. Assailed from all sides by ice-clad specters, he is about to lay down arms, nearly yielding to the unbearable call to vassalage that echoes in his head. The Codex calls him. Remembering Azaria's teachings, he invokes the sun's divine anger against this great darkness. He cleaves his enemies with renewed zeal and vows to put an end to the wicked voice that resounds within him. In a simultaneity only fate could have orchestrated, Vic and Azelion finally reach it. It is here, the Codex, resting on a frail pedestal of elf bones. And sensing a strange familiarity, the fragile musician and the imperious warrior slowly walk around Price's artifact, like two hungry beasts coveting the same prey. Staring each other down, they both know that the outcome of this impending ordeal can only be death. For several days, still in sorcery flash, rivaling in cunning and sheer savagery in a merciless, excruciating showdown. Azalion's resilience and martial prowess ultimately shake Vic's confidence, whose body is soon unable to endure the unceasing slashes of the Holy Blade. In a final indomitable surge, the soldier grapples the old man and brutally slams him to the ground, smashing his bones on the Aegis stone. Under the Codex's amused gaze, light triumphs over darkness, but the artifact knows that it alone will taste victory in the end. As Elion lays his riveted gauntlet on the dried leather of the foul book, on the ground Vic groans with dismay more than with pain, defeated so close to his goal. The young paladin turns around, insolent, staring for one last time at his rival, charred by the radiance of his sword. Slowly, he grasps the Codex, intending to take it to Azadia to be destroyed forever. By what malice could cursed artifact usurp the symmetry divine? These feats are unknown by all sages, past and future. In a reddish glow, the Codex opens wide, 
as a sliver of pure darkness grows from the void. Zalion can only watch powerless as an infinity of lines, barely perceptible threads, emerge from its pages and rise in an arc of perfect proportions. As the book stares intensely at Vic and Azalion, the projection of hypnotic beauty, like a spider weaving its web, meticulously envelops the two contenders down to the smallest constituents. Without a sound, in renewed brightness, Azalion lies on the ground, broken, and Vic stands upright, revitalized, the Kodax in hand, vengeance in his eye. Chapter 3 Ascension mountain stands the first towers of the oppressor. Vikrasna, as he will be known, is no longer a man. Having twisted the words of its dreadful promise, the Codex granted him a draconic soul in form, but eternity has a price. Instead of a magnificent armor of scales, a decayed mantle of rotting skin, once grandiose wings, but Skeletal fingers, where piercing eyes once shone, gaping sockets alight with the fire of destruction. Now wielding the axiomatic words of undeath, Vikrasnar is granted passage to the remote dimension of Maldominia, where he stays free from the shackles of time. There, he recruits a terrifying army of fallen soldiers and banished souls, awaiting only the orders of a lord to once again taste the flesh of men. Shattered by both injury and treachery, Isalion lives on, burdened by a bitter sense of failure and betrayal. Under burning skies, he helplessly watches the spectacle of a desolate world, unable to find any meaning to his futile existence. Having retrieved his body from the depths of Aya, the starry-eyed enchantress once again heals his flesh and mind, bringing him back from the brink of death. This time, however, she finds blooming within herself the first flowers of a garden of love, for the one who blindly, and without expecting anything in return, dedicates his life to Maelon's salvation. As the storm forms in the distance, Azaria patiently restores Azalion's sense of purpose that enlivened him before his fateful encounter with the Codex. Only he has the power to reunite the Guardians. Only he can convince the other races to join his course and regain their freedom. Only he can defeat Vikrasna. Falling for the beautiful druidess as Alion gives in and with a kiss, they seal the promise of a bond so strong only a free world would see it dawn.
top is icy there, the codex hanging from his neck. The new witch king of Maelon revels at the enslavement of an entire world under the yoke of his boundless cruelty. Vikrasna, the serpent sorcerer, worm lord tyrant of the vast and beyond, takes revenge against the misfortunes endured in his former life, tirelessly conquering and destroying the mortal world. The voracious worm searches for ever more terrible secrets deep in the bowels of the earth where cold black lava hides through. The unexpected return of Azelion at the head of the Guardians marks a new beginning. The free races of Maelon answer his call and, for the first time in millennia, all are united under one banner. The land of the living strengthens ties too long neglected in a final attempt at resistance against an inevitable evil. And in this historic unification, hope is born again. With its morale restored, the army of light advances rapidly, gaining on the disorganized evil lord. While Azelion leads the charge at the foot of the volcanic fortress, Azaria hides in the neighboring peaks, leading a squad of battle mages ready to unleash fire in a decisive assault. Usurping the half-open future, the Codex brings to Vic Vazdar's attention the threat of this arcane contingent. Guided by the omniscient artifact, he wreaks upon the unsuspecting magi a maddening breath. He subdues Azadia and, determined to make her suffer for her audacity, nails her to a cross, atop the summit for all to see, handing her over to his thralls to be devoured alive. Feeling with every fiber of his being the suffering of the druidess, Azaleon flies to her rescue, tearing apart the sky with radiant fire. Inspired by this vision of sacrifice, his army encircles the dark fortress and finally feels the wind of victory blowing at their back. But Azalion must hurry, for his lover, to whom he owes his life twice, is being tortured and subjected to the vilest infamies. Vikrasna rises from behind the mountain, blocking the way. In a frenzy, Azelion lunges and drowns him in the full hatred of his people, shattering bones in a fury yet unseen among men. Wounded, the monster braces, keeping his assailant from reaching behind him where Azadia screams as her spirit endures unspeakable torments. Weakening the Codex reshuffles the cards of destiny once more to take its final revenge on the one who has dared to plot against it for centuries. Addressing her with dark words, a death spell withers her battered body, causing a shadow of fear and darkness to emerge. Azaleon stares, horrified, as his beloved is reduced to ashes. Distracted, he cannot see Vikrasgar, who swoops in and grabs him in his bony talons. In a gesture of pure satisfaction, he breaks the warrior's back as easily as a child would a chicken bone. Azadi's ghostly form rises before them and with a swift move, plunges a frigid hand into Azaleon's torso, clutching his heart and reaching it from his chest, still warm and beating. Straddling her new lord, she places the bloody organ into his gaping mouth, and flying as one over the icy crater, they drop Azalian's dying body into the boiling magma of absolute evil. Azalian contemplates his world one last time, before sinking into a maelstrom of perpetual pain as his troops fall to the black fiery breath of the Dracolich. Thus ends the story of Maelon, the 
as described by the Guardians, marking the advent of an age of glory and ascension for the Witch King Vikrasna and his queen under the tutelage of the spirit called the Codex.